Welcome to this session of the reference desk. It's the 16th and 17th of April of 2022. And today, Steve Cooney will be talking about bibliography. Now, I presume that it's in its simple form or definition, a bibliography is simply a list of books. A, a, a bibliophile is a lover of books. But what does a, a list of books mean in the digital age? And what are the complexities around that? Uh, let's just think just briefly for a moment that uh, it's not all books. A, a bibliography is a selection of books. I should say a selection of publications. And we referred uh, previously to the, question, the difficult question of what constitutes a publication. Now, in a Baha'i sense, uh, early bibliographies might have been interested in the Baha'i writings and publications of the Baha'i writings, and then commentaries on those writings. And over time, that literature has multiplied into various social sciences uh, and other types of uh, discipline. And bibliographers have always been interested in official publications from coming from Baha'i institutions, academic publications coming from universities, um, media coverage, and other types of referencing and sources. Now, Steve Cooney has been involved in this issue of what to put in a list for a number of decades. And there are also questions about which languages to cover. And the, in the question of uh, curating a list of materials that are relevant to Baha'i study, or uh, Baha'i practice, there's a question of what constitutes a significant reference. Does a bibliography in a Baha'i sense refer to literally every reference to the Baha'i faith? Or does it refer to significant references to Baha'i material and thought? And these are some of the issues that Steve has been interested in. Because after all, we want to have a curated list if we want to, if we are interested in education or international relations or law or science or the environment or family life, and we refer to a bibliography, we would probably prefer to be referred to a material that has credence, that has authority, that has some accuracy, rather than merely a, a list of everything that has been written in that field. We're after some guidance in that particular area. Now, on the far edge of this question of what constitutes interest in Baha'i bibliography might be materials that have very little reference to, to Baha'i, but are soundly based on Baha'i principles. For example, by Baha'i scientists or others. There's a Baha'i lawyers, international lawyers who use principles, but don't have solid references throughout in the way that historians do. So these are some questions about boundaries as well as the practice of bibliography. So I've invited Steve today to talk about, well, wherever these issues take him so that we can learn about his journey in, in bibliography, acknowledging also that there are other bibliographers online with us. I won't give a, a, a longer account of uh, the tradition of bibliography, um, but I do refer fondly to Eunice Braun's early works such as Know Your Baha'i Literature. And I think Marzia Gale had one or two of these as well in the 1950s to try to make a start of this. And then, of course, Bill Collins' magnificent work in the 1980s. But now we're in the digital age, where do we go? And in the digital age, there's a question not only of how we procure these references and materials, but how we share them and how we collaborate. And again, that's the, the type of topic that Steve has been looking at. So, Steve, thanks for coming online today and over to you for your presentation. Great, right. thanks very much, Graham, um, for the opportunity to uh, share some of my work. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, I'm going to be switching and jumping around a little bit window-wise, but um, let's just start with some of the, because it's a digital age and we're not just dealing with print books anymore, you need to um, have tools that allow you to work with um, digital documents, whether they're books or articles, and typically they're in PDF format, although not, not inevitably. And so when I first started 
doing this. My first investment in software was a product from Thomson Reuters called Reference Manager. And it was originally designed to be kind of a networked software environment for say a research institute. We might have collaborating scholars on, on a network in an institution. Um, but it was very powerful for searching other people's databases. Um, and I'll show you that over time. But that product was discontinued about 2015. And so I migrated to another Clarivate product. But in between, um, a couple of us were experimenting with another tool called Mendeley, which started out life as kind of an open source software product that um, became acquired by Elsevier Science and became commercialized and commodified and evolved into a different product and pricing started to be introduced and storage was limited and you had to buy extra storage and it wasn't, it wasn't kind of a, a good way to go in terms of cost effectiveness. It's really designed for very large, well-funded um, research bodies as well, a bit like reference manager. So in the kind of personal domain, um, I guess most people would probably be working with a tool like EndNote. There are other um, open source products out there and I will just briefly look at that. So there is a tool called Zotero, which integrates with your web browser and allows you, if you find um, some kind of structured reference that the browser add and can find that looks like a bibliographic reference. You can capture it and store it in a local a Zotero cache on your browser and then import it into the desktop tool. And this is Zotero running with some behind material here. Um, and here's an example of one of the items that's been entered. So uh, the editing, editing screen is here, but it's actually a, an attached document. So this also has that feature of attaching documents. So if you don't, if you want to choose a product that's relatively cost free, um, and does have a limited amount of collaboration in terms of storing your documents on the cloud and you can buy additional storage at a re relatively reasonable cost and I would um, suggest you consider Zotero. It's a very, it uses open standards as well and there are, I don't know if um, our friends from BahaiLibrary.com or any of the sort of software developers are online, Graham, is, Not sure, but um, there are there are products that allow you to host the bibliographic data and serve it up as a sort of a, a server environment as well. Steve, not so at the that, moment. I can't see. No, way. so that's so why I won't go, go too far down that path. But Joan Joan is considering redeveloping his website and looking for new ways to store and access his data, and that's that's one possibility. Is that I mean, he stores all of his items in in such a tool. But this is just one example. Um, this has got some Baha'i content and I did actually post the Zotero file online at one point. I don't think there was much interest at the time, but the example that we have here is sort of play, goes to Graham's point about well, what's a significant reference. This article is about <clears throat> the theory and practice of translation and when does translation and rewriting history begin. And, and it's curious because the Baha'i reference is rather indirect. So this is kind of a study of how sources mutate over time. Um, but it just happens to be that the, the material he's referencing is Baha'i material from the Tanzimat era in Ottoman times. So that's why it's in my list because I regard it as a significant reference, even though it's kind of peripheral to the main story so that's a kind of a skill judgment and it's really depends what your purposes of your collection is going to be graham and i have kind of talked on and off over the years about uh doing a bibliographic publication whether it's online or a book or a service or whatever which is focused on yeah it's a curated list of probably tending towards more uh, scholarly references to the Baha'i faith over uh, they've been around for since in really the 1880s onwards um, capturing that into some kind of database to give a really focused um, quality um, bibliographic view is something we'd like to do 
if I just head back to EndNote, which is my current tool, just a little bit of a um, skip around the, the features. So um, I can, it's easy enough to add a reference, but I can also import little EndNote individual items um, if they're in a structured format. And they typically are exported from many sites as um, either, but can import many kinds of files, but they're typically an ENL file or EndNote library file, or a, it still imports the old um, reference manager format, which is called RIS. And that's also quite commonly found on the internet. It's sort of a hangover from the day when it dominated um, the market, but um, Clarivate was a spin off company and they just simplified their offerings. But essentially, <coughs> I can import files from, from anywhere, or I can create them de novo from, from a, just a new blank reference and get started. And you've got multiple kinds of types of data to um, classify from um, musical works to pamphlets to conference proceedings or whatever. And even sometimes deciding what is, what is the thing that it is, is can be quite difficult. Conference proceedings you often think is uh, a one-off thing, um, but they can also be long-running series as well. So it's sometimes, um, yeah, it's a judgment call as to what goes where. And in many cases, you can consult others who have tried to catalog that similar item. So I will often, if I'm kind of stuck with something, I will often cross-reference against other sources, whether that's a um, large public or university library or WorldCat, uh, or anything else that's sort of sort of handy and look for consistency and, and cataloging. But essentially, yeah, this is this is where you enter data. And the other thing is that you can attach documents, one or more PDFs. Now EndNote is pretty much only really understands PDFs. So and sometimes you'll need to convert to that format. So it you can store, I can store an EPUB file in there, but I, I can't open or do anything with it. I can uh, download it and view it with another tool, but it's pretty much depends on PDF. The reason why I also like um, EndNote is because it has a um, an iPad application. <clears throat> so that allows me to, I can sync my um, database to the cloud store. So this is running off my local machine, but there is a cloud store for um, all of the, um, EndNote documents in your file. Uh, just find where I've, I think I've logged on something with that. Yeah, so this is, I've logged on to the cloud version of what we were just looking at. So EndNote stores all of my data in a safe place on the cloud. Um, it kind of matches my groups and I'll explain groups shortly. Um, but what it does mean is if, if I have a mobile app um, there's no, as far as I know, I haven't looked at lately, there's no Android equivalent, but there's an iPad application, which effectively means you can take your whole library with you wherever you go. And so I can um, use the application here. It's on an iPhone, but on an iPad, you've got more screen real estate, but I can literally be um, commuting on the train uh, to work. And if I need, if I want to read something in that hour's travel that I do each way each day, then I can easily retrieve a document and read it online from my cloud store. I don't have to be in my office. I can I can do it remotely. And it's quite handy if you're going to scholarly events or you're going to a meeting or a gathering that's interested in these kinds of matters, you can literally bring um, your library with you. So that's one of the other advantages that, um, that I like about EndNote. Now, this is, I've been building this collection for a long period of time. Essentially, um, it represents quite a few years of cataloging, but it also represents um, the failed detour into Mendeley. And as a result, when we migrated from Mendeley, we got quite a lot of duplication in the database and it's still present. So I'm still actually weeding it out, but there are useful tools in here to find duplicates. So, this is, a, this is a group, a smart group, which is like a virtual collection of papers. So I've put all in articles and books. So I've put them all in one place. I've sort of divided up my timeframes um, 
by the periods of the central figures through to the end of the guardian's uh, life and then roughly in 20 year increments. So you can see that <laughs> the period of 1980 to 1999 um, is way larger than you'd expect. And that's because that's where most of the duplicates are sitting. Um, but I've, over time, I'm just weeding them out. I just um, can do a brute force removal and let EndNote figure it out, but I'd rather just do it one by one. Uh, but this one here, this current list, which has started at the beginning of 2020, um, shows you the items that I've managed to collect. And just before I came down, <clears throat> 14th of April, I started to uh, retrieve material that I'd been posting to Calumet. Uh, Calumet is a, is a list that I started a couple of years ago, which is dedicated to bibliographic kind of work. And I'm not sure if there are any subscribers online, but essentially it's an email list. And it's, it's kind of, it's, much, it's pretty much a monologue from me most of the time. Occasionally a publication will interest one or two people and there'll be a little bit of conversation, but essentially it's where I can post stuff and uh, what I use it for is I go back to it and systematically catalog from there based on what I've posted because they're not necessarily posted as bibliographic items. So um, I've, I'm playing catch up on that list. So um, here's some entries that I added from uh, last week. And now I'm just today, yesterday, I think last night. I started to review them, update them, and actually add the document they were, were referring to. So the thing, the thing about EndNote is it's a continuous process. You're never finished. You're always refining and improving. Um, another uh, interesting aspect of EndNote is the ability to search other library systems or other databases. So I've just done some quick searches this morning. This is me interrogating the Library of Congress. This is all configuration inside EndNote. <clears throat> and I've just searched for this subject. Um, someone like uh, Bill Collins would be much smarter with mesh headings or subjects or whatever, but other types of subject. But I've just brute done, done this kind of global search for behind. Um, for the publication year 2021, and this is what it's returned to me. Now, most of that I'm familiar with. Um, there's a couple of publications here, Mujan. I'm not sure if you're aware of these. Um, this is from Tehran, so you assume it's yeah, it's been pub it's been published, it's been catalogued from the Library of Congress. Islamabad Overseas Office, so it's come out of Pakistan. So I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, but it's most it's not likely to be um, favorable to the faith, I suspect. But they, they're they've, there. Steve, they've learned from me that anything published in Persian in Iran about the Baha'i faith um, is very likely to go under Baha'i faith controversial works. Yes, which is interesting. I wonder how they've yeah, so that's exactly what they've done. Controversial about. literature, yeah. Yeah. So, and there's another one here that's not familiar to me too, but it's come from the same office. Um, yeah, there's no subject headings here as well. It's more of a pamphlet. But you can see that, you know, just one one simple query for one given year returns items. And for me, I'm less interested in this kind of material. Um, I may or may not um, catalogue it depending on what I think of it, who's the author or the context or whatever, because usually it's fairly worthless stuff. Um, but however, I will, and I, I also want to talk a little bit about trends um, and patterns. So uh, in the volume of material, is it increasing or decreasing? Are we actually publishing more material? And so I've got a few brief observations. So over the last 20 years, um, especially in the area of significant peer-reviewed or publications with robust scholarly apparatus, as I would say, have increased markedly. <clears throat> and so now um, what, what was essentially published in internal Baha'i publishing trusts and Baha'i linked publishing companies 
for example, George Ronald, uh, have, have migrated into the mainstream. So it's now fairly common to find books published by large um, publishing corporations, Palgrave, Macmillan, Routledge, uh, Brill especially, because it's kind of their territory as much as anything. Um, it's just kind of at will now. And so that's kind of a breakthrough, if you like. And what it means is well, high faith is no longer in that. Mm, maybe you're a, a um, in, in the category of a, a well, yeah. You're no longer in the category of kind of cult territory, you've made it to the mainstream. And so for example, I'm just looking at these, um, this Brian McNamara's book published by Brill and the prestigious Newman book series. Um, there's actually more than one Baha'i title in that series now, and it runs about 180 titles. So that's one of the shifts is that <clears throat> Baha'i books have moved into moved from being largely a Baha'i publishing concern to into the mainstream, which is makes it, the exposure better for the author, but it also changes the cost equations for people acquiring the publications, because many of these books are priced as if they were going to be dozens or hundreds of library users, and so they're priced accordingly and not priced for the individual purchaser. So. Uh, books that would have been $30, $40, are now to $150 to $250 New Zealand dollars and higher, depending on the book and the length of number. The, the number of pages, the larger the number of pages, the, the higher the price it seems. But it does mean that, yeah, these books are both um, less accessible to Baha'i library budgets, um, but more accessible to the mainstream. Um, I remember a lot of these books are also available in large digital collections. The print versions are kind of bonus revenue for publishers because they all print on demand. What these do is these enrich digital collections that uh, large libraries purchase and so they, they just augment their collection and you buy it, you buy the whole collection and um, the unit cost is, is more um, palatable than owning and shipping the actual print books. But for those who want the print books and where, you, where it's not feasible for a small Baha'i library in a small community to subscribe to such large collections, then you're kind of in a bit of a rock and hard place. But it varies a lot though. So this book here um, has just been published um, from uh, Oxford University Press. And it's actually relatively manageable cost-wise. I think it's around about the 50 New Zealand dollar kind of mark, but this is probably um, not the norm these days. Now, um, what I'd like to do is just talk a little bit about my strategies for finding stuff, because I think that's probably of interest to people. So what I do is um, just find a new, um, web browser and essentially what I've learned over the last 20 years is that um, Google is more or less omniscient. Um, it will find and ferret out most things given enough time. And so what I do is I take advantage of that. I use, um, am I still sharing my screen? Am I on the right? Yes, we can see it. Yeah, great. We can see it yeah. In Google. So, so Google Scholar is is kind of the place of choice. So I subscribe. I have a number of searches um, which I use Google Scholar for because I found by um, comparing and contrasting and looking at what other material comes in um, that Google is getting around about ninety to 95% of the materials found here, one way or another. But I have a, I use a, um, I use a search item like this, which has kind of got a number of ways to capture the word Baha'i or Barbieism or Barbie or whatever. And that's covers quite a lot of territory 
this is not so common these days, but it's worth including in the list because even even some recent publications will still use this um, by now unorthodox kind of term. And so I will search using Google Scholar. Um, and I can also um, filter by a particular year. So what I also find useful is to backtrack. So Google will unearth um, new archives, new digitization, um, new materials that are put online that weren't there when I first did the search. So um, it's worth going back in time to another, to either a period or a year. Um, but if I, what, what I find is that publications spill over into the calendar year for quite a long period of time, up to six months after the year has ended, you know, late publications, journals that are running behind schedule, um, print books that just have the wrong, literally have the wrong copyright or to have taken a long time to get published or whatever. So it is worth going back in time and you can do that by putting a custom date range. But essentially, the, va the value of this is that I can import, I've configured under my settings to default to EndNote. So if I look at site, I do have these options. I mentioned BibText. This is the open source kind of bibliographic format. EndNote, Reference Manager, and RefWorks is another product. But I've just turned it on to just have add this to the list. So what, let me just find something maybe that, uh, the trouble with this is that um, searching by relevance can be quite, um, it can obscure useful materials and put them to the back of the list. Basically, what you have to do is you have to go through the whole set, set of results. So for 20, 2021, there's 2000 results here. And I will, I will literally go from beginning to end. Even when you get into the kind of 60, 70% mark, you're starting to get into very minor references or um, yeah, nothing, nothing of any bibliographic consequence, but if you persevere, um, you will find some occasional gems throughout the whole list. So you have to be quite determined. You have to um, be, you have to persevere with um, these kinds of lists because the algorithms for showing you what it thinks is relevant or sorting by date it depends on when the thing was published. And if you're going across a whole year, then it may be that um, something that was published recently still ends up at the back of the list. You can't control the sort order. Um, you can't, well, ideally you'd want to say, well, show me them in the order that Google found them, but it doesn't work like that. Here's an example of something that I added to EndNote uh, and, and previously published to Calimat find my groups. Um, it's this article here. Now, I've already downloaded the attached document, um, but the advantage is that Google will identify the PDF if there's one present. So if you want to be, only want to click things that you can find, whereas I don't, I don't do that. I try and be, if it's something of interest, so for example, Nata Saidi's article here, you will not find a PDF on the internet where Google hasn't found one. So if you really want this article, you will either have to find a colleague who has access or pay some exorbitant fee, which could be anywhere up to, well, these days, 45 US dollars per article. Um, or you write to Nada Saidi and say, dear Nada, I'd love to have a copy of your article. <clears throat> Which I did, and um, he said, well, my library doesn't subscribe to that journal. So he was out of luck with his own article. Um, but that's the kind of thing you have to do is um, not only capture the item, but it's not really useful to you if you're a writer, unless you have the article itself. But at least Google does indicate here that it has it. So. Um, I, can, I will typically import and denote, um, which will generate a little file down here. And I literally just have to click on it and it's imported into EndNote and I can then go and refine it and groom it later. But if I want the actual article, then Google will take me to the journal itself, um, just popped up over here. So it's a fairly obscure um, 
un, not very well known uh, geographical education journal, but that's the other kind of emerging trend, if you like, um, proliferation of journals. So this is partly um, developing nations developing their own academic scholarly infrastructure and wanting to um, build their own sort of sources of um, bibliographic material, but it has also led to the proliferation of um, relatively poor quality, poorly edited, um, badly peer reviewed, or um, yeah, the, the, over, the quality is not comparable with um, many um, large companies that have been doing this line of business for in some cases a few centuries so they've, they've practiced that it and ironed out the wrinkles but this would be a good example of something that's coming from emerging territories and emerging environments None, nonetheless the value of capturing it is um, there's very little material about the Baha'is of Vietnam I think it is um, if I was to look in my EndNote database um, Probably it's in the title. Do a bit of a quick search across what I have there. Yeah, so there's not a lot really compar comparing compar comparably because the Baha'i community of Vietnam, especially in the 1970s, was quite um, large and prosperous and it's only now starting to get back on its feet. Um, but that's my view of what I know about. Um, the Baha'i faith in Vietnam. So I've added that. Now that's that duplicate there is just simply because I just added it by clicking on that file. So it's now becomes a duplicate. But essentially, um, that's why that's that makes my collection, so to speak, because I just know from having a sort of a comprehensive view of all the material published that um, Vietnam is underrepresented or there's not a lot of um, useful material. Right, back to back to Google Scholar. Yes, so um, this is probably, as I say, is probably my my key place. So I I get um, these pushed into my mailbox every second day or so. The problem is, is that um, there's a lot, the, the noise is quite high. So I think um, people who try this probably get turned off because you have to scan it. And some days there's literally nothing or it's an extremely brief mention or, so I'm picking that this um, article about um, reflections on the religious neighborhood in Acre, in Acre or Aka, I may well have something useful. And this one too, too. Graham, I don't know if you've saw this, do you know Solomon? Mamaloni, has he got some uh, high connections? Now that, that popped up just yesterday as I was traveling. I'm very keen. Uh, he, he was a prime minister of Solomon Islands uh, and a very controversial figure. So I'm just intrigued to see what the Baha'i reference is in it. Yeah, so look, I literally haven't had time to look, but that is essentially the process of sifting the wheat is that you, you, you know, you, I mean, this, this possibly references in here as well. Um, but there's a, there is a lot of noise in there because it turns out that <clears throat> there is a um, a very famous um, semiconductor scientist, and now he's the head of large semiconductor corporation. Um, his name is Ahmad Bahai, and um, he has got many, many patents on wireless technology, and so his name pollutes all of these references because anything to do with wireless um, will reference his seminal patents and or original scientific work. So that's the kind of thing you have to, you have to bear with is that, yeah, okay, there are people who are, who are named Baha'i and it's nothing to do with the Baha'i faith, but it is just one of the things that you, you have to adjust to. But yes, so here's a, those, as Graham pointed out, that is probably a relatively minor reference, but if you are trying to assemble, uh, a Pacific Melanesian view of Baha'i history or networks of Baha'i's influences is probably a key reference. It's probably one that Graham will put in his database. And I will look at it and if I, if I think it's significant enough, not just a minor reference, 
I might well include it as well. Um, because that's where the, the challenge is, is where do you begin and end? So I think um, in the early days when there was a paucity of material, um, people would just collect anything, even if it was a, a dictionary reference or an um, encyclopedia reference with a couple of lines mentioning Baha'i. But I think you, there's too much material now to, to do those very minor references. But where they, my kind of criteria is where they document unknown facts or where it's based on original research or based on manuscripts or archives that's unearthing some relationship, some connection to the Baha'i faith that could well lead to um, new scholarly insights or expanding the uh, horizon of our understanding of the reception of the Baha'i faith or its um, influence in human society, um, then they, they definitely make the grade. So it's part of the bibliographer's skill. I mean, you, you, you just have to learn your field and know what the territory is and um, become familiar with what's what's new and what's original and what's been said before and and so forth and the, yeah, there have there are thematic interests as well so i can i have other one of my kind of projects <laughs> i should just say briefly is that <clears throat> i'm perfectly capable of writing material but i i'm i'm much more a reader than a writer um, but I do have a couple of projects that I would like to um, complete before I expire from this world. And one of them is, as I've mentioned, is potentially a scholarly bibliography of the Baha'i faith um, from the beginnings to the present day. And whether that is a print book or online, I'm not sure, but um, that will be one project. But, you know, for example, I've had this long running project, which I actually manage in um, EndNote. And um, I've been interested for a long time in the intellectual history of the um, oneness of mankind. So uh, where's it gone? It's just hiding here. So I've, I've been gathering material on the unity of mankind, the unity of the human race for uh, quite a long period of time. Um, and eventually it will, I hope, lead to some kind of study because it's, you know, the, the cardinal central principle of the high faith, but turns out there's been a lot of footsteps along that way. So that is, that's just another interest, um, not uh, it's indirectly connected to the Baha'i faith. Obviously, that will that will be woven into the story, but there's more to it than meets the eye. So I can have multiple EndNote databases. I can only have one that I synchronize to the cloud. And in theory, I can also share that database with others. The other thing about um, EndNote is that you can um, create virtual collections of what are called smart groups, they're based on filters. So um, I group all of these together based on the year of publication. So I've just, as I say, um, started in the beginning of 2020. So we're now April, 2022. And so I've recorded 328 publications so far. And I, I'm guessing I'm probably 50 or 60 behind at this point in time. So if you say nearly 400 references uh, in a two year time frame would be roughly about right. So 1960 to 1979, that's 4,300 in there. Um, some of these are imported from Bill Collins EndNote database. And these are serials, Baha'i serials. So I haven't systematically collected those because my knowledge of Baha'i serials is not comprehensive enough. I don't have a world view of those, but I do know what's sort of in my neighborhood. Uh, that's the period 2000 to 2019. So you can see that it's probably increased by nearly 45% on that time period. And we're kind of tracking in a similar direction. But as I say, what's changed is that the material that would have been published in the past and probably catalogued in this 1960 to 1980 period um, were often short pamphlets, booklets that were used for teaching material. 
But these days, it's all online. There are blog posts, there are digital documents, there are websites, there are YouTube videos. There's an enormous variety of material that um, replaces what used to be behind pamphlets and behind teaching booklets and that kind of thing. So they've sort of fallen away. And the books that are being published, um, and most of them are still available in print or one form and that, um, have moved into a more solid kind of territory, so to speak. So more original research or more integrative research or more comprehensive views of themes that might have been difficult to envisage a whole book on 20, 30 years ago, but um, mastered it with relative ease today. Excuse me, Steve. Yeah. Uh, I don't. Well, I don't mean to interrupt your train of thought, but I'm just wondering whether you could demonstrate um, how this uh, endnote could be used. For example, if we said theses on education, could you show how easy it is to uh, select out a thesis and education, and hit um, uh, copy formatted, and that would give a quick and and maybe then just drop that into a, a word page. And just show how easy it is to to do a sort uh, to get oh, it's to, to extract lists. Yes. Well. Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, that was probably another thing I wanted to do quickly is how to, how this. So, my my previous session was a was kind of supply side. So, what would I what would I be supplying to a potential bibliographer? And I mentioned that, you know, on the library.abs uh, development site, you can export any uh, item as a bibliographic file and import it into EndNote. I'm not going to go back and do that, but essentially um, this is the other side of the coin. It's me as a consumer. So um, yeah, I, I can I can do that, but I've also wanted to just show you how this works from a Word document. So this is EndNote has been integrated into my Word processor with some plugins and add-ons. Now Let's just say I'm writing something about studies of Iranian Baha'i communities. Um, and I just happen to write this. I can insert this and I can insert a citation from my EndNote database. Um, so um, if I just, you know, I need to put Mujan's name, but it will find that article by Mujan here. And I can just insert it straight into my document. Now it's formatted at it as an APA style format, but I can choose hundreds, if not thousands of different formats. Um, and it will, it's built a work cited list for me down here. And I can also change the format of that as I go. So this is um, a kind of writer's view. I can, depending on who I'm submitting my paper to, I can quickly reformat it for that target audience. So this is the sort of use, this is the writer, <laughs> the writer side of EndNote for usefulness. And I can also just do a conventional footnote. So um, if I put in a footnote and I can then go to EndNote and insert the same article and in the style of whichever I choose. So this is just showing how EndNote interrogates behind the scenes my database and integrates it with my writing process. So let's say I'm writing something on the laws of the Qatabi Arctis that relate to inheritance. So um, if I make this claim, an understudied aspect of the Baha'i faith, I can also um, add, add, I add, another, add a footnote in here as well. <clears throat> and this time I'm going to get in note to insert um, anything that's related to inheritance. And I know that this is an area that's <coughs> um, got some publications, but not a great deal. So these are two recent ones. Um, there is an article by Sue McGlynn and Dialogue Magazine and Sina Fazal. I can insert all four into here um, just like that and carry on working. So they're, they're just kind of examples of how endnotes are value to a writer. 
Um, and if I'm looking at one of these and it's not, see that's poorly formatted, I can actually update it from here and it will write back to the EndNote database. But as Graham said, you can also filter your, uh, once your lists get into the tens of thousands, it can become a bit unwieldy. So one of the, one of the patterns, one of the trends you're interested in if you're a scholarly writer is, are people writing um, particularly doctoral theses on original aspects of the Baha'i faith at a higher rate now than they were in the 1980s? So um, I can choose a reference type um, thesis um, and I can filter the title, but um, I'll just get all the theses in one place. So 214, so I would have to then maybe create some smart groups and count them, but um, so far, yes, some duplicates. But this, gives, this allows you to, oh, I've lost mine. This allows you to filter by this and maybe you could extract, I can extract all of this um, as a list, for example, I can sort it. So it starts from 1923, Alter S. Neil, I think he's one of the earliest thesis writers um, right to the present day. Um, and I can copy formatted reference and I can get this into a new document and EndNote will pass it in. And in fact, the way I've, my formatted reference, I can structure that as well. I can customize what um, EndNote exports as. Um, it's just, um, uses a little template language for you to, you know, customize the style. In my case, I've, I've got the abstract added as well. And so you may or may not want the abstract, but you, that's not inevitable, you can change it. So it's sorted by author, pasted them into a list and voila, I've got a 44,000 word document listing all the theses on the Baha'i Faith. Is that kind of what you wanted to suggest, Graham? Yes, thanks, um, Steve, because yeah. I think that shows the sense in which somebody's interested in architecture or tourism or whatever it is, they can pick a theme, they can pick a journal article, they can pick a, a, a whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, and you've not just got a bibliography, but there you've got an annotated bibliography depending yes. on how you use the abstract uh, field. So, so that, I wanted to show that because I think anybody in any field can then uh, feel confident that they could um, you know, start to produce a select bibliography. Oh, yeah. I don't know how you could possibly do it without such sort of tools as a database like this. So, yeah, these... Um, um, but they, they've just evolved over quite a long period of time to support writers. So... Um, yeah, and if I just want to, uh, I probably will, and if once I get up to date with my list, so I probably will extract all of the publications in 2021 um, that I have either submitted or have that are in my list here and um, publish um, a similar document to what I just generated to the Calimat bibliography list so that the um, subscribers can see the whole one whole year's worth of material um, in one sort of go. And yeah, this, there's a lot of advantages to putting all of your stuff into a database. Um, it's multifaceted. So as I say, you've got the kind of the mobile angle. I've got the sharing thing. You can share your database with other EndNote users. Um, the cloud storage is 100,000 items, some, some large number like that. Um, and in, uh, every one of them can have a document attached to it. So there's no real limit to the storage. So in some cases, um, there's whole digitized books from uh, Google Books in here, um, which are quite large uh, documents. So all of that is just stored up in the cloud. And as I say, I can literally you know, find these book, find this material um, on a train or a plane or cafe or wherever I am. So um, that's kind of the tools in a nutshell. Um, I also just wanted to go back to strategies again. So Google Scholar is key, but 
They also um, supplement that by obviously um, going to some of the major buy publishing sites, um, amazon.com has a massive, it's, it's almost unlikely that any book, any printed book is not on Amazon um, these days because they really do control the whole market and they control it in multiple ways. So they also own this site, ABE Books. Um, and this is started out life as a secondhand bookstore aggregator site. So all the booksellers would put their lists of books for sale up here and um, you could search through and look for secondhand um, books. But gradually it's become more and more um, infiltrated with new publications. Um, but you can certainly search here and you will find occasionally um, self-published books in particular um, or regional books or local books published in the local community with a limited kind of circulation um, for sale at these booksellers. So if you're really, if you're a serious kind of um, in bibliophile, um, then ABE books is something that I will supplement, but I would only look at the, look at that, the location three or four times a year, because you can easily search for keywords and you can search by year of publication. So you can sort it um, by um, the most recent year and just, just take a look, scan through that. And the other thing that's interesting about ABE books, it, it's when it first originally arrived, it had a large amount of material, well, high material, secondhand material. I guess in the pre 1970s to the sort of, um, turn of the century um, all, almost all of that material is gone now you won't find it for sale it's been acquired by some people or it's just gone out of circulation so <clears throat> I guess um, that's a side effect of you know auction sites selling sites um, materials being exposed it's been acquired and is now out of circulation but it does mean there are probably other collectors out there and the difficulty is that they don't know that there are other collectors. And so there's no real network of book collectors. Um, I think uh, there was an attempt in the 1980s to um, get some kind of book collectors organized. I think um, nine, yeah, Ant Anthony Lee and um, what was the other? Los Angelian, who was So, but, but nothing ever really came of it. So, um, but also, so ABE, ABE Books, however, is now owned by Amazon. So it's an Amazon company. So now they've, they've cross injecting their material. So Amazon stuff comes in here and ABE Books stuff goes to Amazon. So Amazon also sells secondhand books. So the utility of keeping them separate is less so. Um, because they really are interoperable. And also, I, I, I guess you all know that Book Depository is the same uh, company as now owned by Amazon, was spun off by an Amazon executive who then sold it back to Amazon. So really, between these kind of three mega sites, you'll find most new material um, most of the time. Um, but the best search engine is Amazon. But however, what has happened the last year or two is that people have cottoned on on how to pollute the kind of um, search algorithms. And also they're probably using some AI bots um, to help find material. Um, so what, when you search for Baha'i, this is the most common representation of it. Um, you find a lot of material is contaminated with all sorts of other stuff where the other authors have used behind keywords or the AI bot says, oh, wait, um, you're interested in Baha'i stuff, but this is kind of related. How about why well, I put this in your list? So these lists are full of irrelevant stuff. And I suspect some of these publications, which are just silly notebooks, they're using Baha'i keywords um, to bring them to the top of their list. So Amazon has unfortunately become quite um, a polluted um, search engine as well. So I think that discourages people. However, if you persevere, you will find um, interesting material. For example, this, I think I posted last week, 
Uh, Robert Mezzibuco has published a number of books. Um, so many, he's got his own author site now. Um, and this is not all of them, there's a couple of other titles. But just, yeah, that's pretty much in a nutshell that will cover most of the use cases um, for finding most Baha'i material. Um, but then it's still useful to supplement it with searches of um, library catalogs, which you can do from EndNote. And um, for example, Library of Congress, there's the British Library. Uh, they don't often have large comprehensive collections, but sometimes they will find, you'll find some interesting material um, that is just local to the, um, local to Britain or um, also the British Library can sometimes be useful for cataloging information, but really, um, the best source um, outside of those commercial entities is WorldCat. So I will quite consistently search WorldCat. But even having said that, there's a lot of behind material that somehow doesn't make any library catalog. And it's a little bit of a mystery. So I suspect this is policies of, and encouragement for Baha'i writers to submit their material to um, libraries of record like the Library of Congress in the United States or the National Library of New Zealand, where you know they encourage you to submit copies of anything that's printed in New Zealand to the libraries of record, but it seems to have fallen by the wayside in, in many cases. So many, many books are not catalogued and I'd be interested in your thoughts about that, Bill. But that's pretty much, I've wrapped up my time. I'm more interested in having a bit of a conversation, but I just wanted to to sort of show you the consumer side of um, bibliographic material rather than just being a, a producer. So I'll just leave it there and maybe we can chat and have some questions, thoughts and considerations. And Thanks, Steve. It's uh, great to have you share your process with us. And so now we'll we've got a bit of time for some questions for Steve. I don't know if you want to unshare your screen or leave it yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm just, no, I'm happy to In case there's questions. Are you sure? Are you sure? Um, um, but that's, that's, that's just a brief um, intro, really, to give you a bit of a flavour of uh, what it's like to do the things that I, I, I must have some hoarding genes or something, because my father was a bit of a, a bit of a hoarder, but I think it all helps, right, if you like to collect and organize, but it's no, the thing is to turn it into a value to the rest of mankind. So that's, yeah, converting this into an asset that's of benefit to other scholars is really the, the big challenge. And, um, well, look, let's let's cut to one of the, rather, rather than, uh, Mujin, I'll get to you in, in a second. Thank you for that question uh, coming up. Um, you know, I think the, the critical issue uh, that com will come out of uh, Steve's presentation is uh, in the digital era, uh, what is the collaborative process here for uh, sharing product? So uh, Bill Collins' bibliography was a, um, a large book printed, a one-off, uh, and, and it served its purpose. And people have always asked whether Bill's going to do a second edition. Now, the question is, do we go for printed volumes for selected years, for example, from the 1980s, Onwards, Steve's mentioned this idea of picking a period of time and either producing hard copy or uh, a defined uh, time bound series that can be used by others. And I think that's at the end of questions about process, that's going to be uh, the uh, question about uh, where this is leading as a product. Uh, Mujan, please, your question. Yeah. Um it was actually just sort of picking up from your last sentence there, Steve, about uh, how to get it, how to sort of get all of this useful, very, very useful material um, out there so that people can actually use it. Um, I mean, if I more or less sort of run the Aplan Library website, and I'm wondering how easy is it to have an interface between a bibliography and the website that would be um, not just sort of people looking up individual books, but people being able to do this sort of work like, you know, all the theses on Baha'i history or something, um, you know, uh, search, searches of, of subject areas. Um, uh, 
I, I imagine that, that there's a lot of places that do this. I mean, um, most libraries presumably have such, well, I know they do have, have such um, things, but where, how easy is it to actually set it up? Um, not that easy. Um, because as soon as you want to start sharing and collaborate, you then have to manage users. Um, users want to be able to um, retrieve their set of references and should they download them or you just you know build your own set inside your database um, do you store it all in the cloud and then there's the costs um, cloud is ubiquitous and you can get to it anywhere anywhere in the world and you can get to it on any kind of device but the complexity of doing such a thing is quite high um, it's not impossible though, there are definitely products, open source products as well, that will, will allow you to create a central database that can be shared, um, users would come in, they, they would probably um, build their own subsets of information, and also you want the ability for them to contribute back and grow the collection. So then you've got to um, have queues where that stuff is stored, it probably needs vetting and verification, confirmation, standardization or whatever. Um, so there are good examples on the internet of people who have tried to do this sort of thing in other different um, domains, if you like. So if you're into, if you're a music lover, which I am as well, um, Discogs, for example, is a database of music and um, it stores virtually every kind of musical genre and format that was ever published. Um, and users can join and they can add their own, upload their own record collection if you've got an obscure piece of vinyl record or uh, some edition of uh, some popular music that was only released in Australia, which can happen, then you can add that to your, to, to Discogs. Um, and you can improve the um, cover art and the, and the CD lyric sheets or whatever it is and upload them to here. So there are, there are Good examples of how of sort of collectible things can be built into a database. So I think it, I think you try and do it on your own is quite tricky. I think you need a, a team to collaborate on it, and you need people who are skilled with um, databases. And we, you know, you need to structure your data really carefully with um, bibliographic records because um, it's very easy to get the schemas wrong. Um, you need, you need web developers, you need people who are involved in security and identity. I mean, exposing a, a public site that anyone can interact with uh, is immediately a very high security bar these days. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a non-trivial problem to solve. I don't know, I know that doesn't help, but yes, <laughs> I think it is possible, but it would require a consortium um, of, people and it would require potentially significant funds but if you got it to the point where all the bibliographers from all the nations of the world where the Baha'is have such bibliophiles and bibliographers and they could collaborate into a universal scheme that would be the ultimate dream right so your, your African bibliographers your Asian bibliographers you know people who are one of the one of the other trends I wanted to mention in the last 10 years is the um, rapid growth of material coming out of Indonesia. So there's a lot of material printed and published in Indonesian university settings. And Graham, you might be able to comment about how the kind of tertiary education is evolving in um, Indonesia. It's moving out of that um, um, under you know, religious universities into more secular environments and a more Western style of education. And so that's being reflected in the um, production of more and more Baha'i related material. So there are trends and patterns. You could literally start to um, have an agent in Indonesia who just keeps up to date with the Indonesian material. Google finds it, but it, you know, it's what we really need is an active person contributing that element. Um, another area that's been growing quite rapidly is, um, and it might, might be, I'm surmising it might be a reflection of the success of Baha'i programs of um, child education. It's a big expanse and then big growth in the number of Baha'i children's storybooks and material for under 10 year olds. Um, and I think that's a success story of 
uh, the growth in behind children's classes. But that's a whole field in itself. You know, people will be interested in what what has been done in the Baha'i community to educate and train children in their religious faith and to build their kind of religious identity. Um, children's literature is a whole field of study. So again, you can have a specialist in that area as well. Thanks, Steve. Uh, we've got a question from Bill. We've got a, a question from Stephen Phelps. And Steve, we also have a comment from Carmel, uh, which you'll see online. So over to Bill, then Stephen, and response to Carmel. Just a couple things. Uh, I'm sorry Jonah's not in on here today because he has put out feelers to a number of us about something on the Baha'i Library site uh, being done for an ongoing uh, online bibliography. And I think, as Steve says, there's there's a lot to consider when trying to do something like that. Uh, so, but just be aware that he has uh, put out some feelers on that. Um, the the other thing, Steve, you may you mentioned something uh, toward the end of your uh, original remarks about libraries that seem not to have records or uh, of Baha'i books. Were you speaking specifically about the British Library? No, no. Just in, I mean, uh, even the New Zealand case. Um, okay. There's there's a number of just for example, I'm sure it happens elsewhere. Is if you look at libraries of record. So these are where um, you yeah. need to make a statutory deposit. So New Zealand has such a library. I know for a fact that, I mean, and these publications are often not that important in the grand scheme of things, but they all should be registered with an ISBN, Absolutely. with the National Library that goes into their catalogue and it's a system of record. Yeah. So anyone in New Zealand who searches the National Library and looks for behind will find most of the publications that have ever been published yes. in New Zealand yeah. missing. And um, there's this a few. But it's, but it's just knowledge and training and and, and pr business procedure really that's missing. Right. But I think this is more not just New Zealand; it's everywhere. No, it's a problem around the world because I have found that when I'm looking for something that I see on the uh, um, on the Baha'i Publishing Trust of India website, for instance, and I say, "Oh, they don't give all the information about it," so I say, "Oh, National Library of India will have it," and they don't. Yeah. And so I have to inform the publishing trust in India, hey, have you deposited your book with the National Library of India? Because that will give me the specific data that they're not showing because they're just selling books. They're not trying to make books available for people to understand the different editions and so on. So yeah, that's a challenge. It's also a challenge with the British Library because it often takes them forever to put the record up, I have to say. so. Yeah. Or um, it's incomplete or a very marginal. Sort yes. Of, yeah. Um, yes. And it's, it, it, it's training for it's training for the Baha'i publishers, and it's also training for individual Baha'is who start some little, you know, company where they publish two or three things, and they they don't understand the the legal requirements. And if the National Library doesn't know of the existence of it, they're also not going to demand it. So mm -hmm. there's this break in both ends uh being able to to get the thing yeah so a recent example in new zealand was a children's book um printed in auckland new zealand which i doubt i don't imagine it's probably in china but that's the uh, place of publication i'm um, with british um library cataloging and publication data obviously you need to log on to the website to find it so Printed in New Zealand, according to the materials on the book, probably not printed here, but anyway, um, definitely not in the New Zealand National um, mm -hmm. Library record. So yeah, it's that is that is makes it difficult to build uh, visibility and identity of the of the public. So I, next week, I am planning to discuss this whole question of how uh, Baha'is might. Uh, be recommenders to national and academic libraries and get themselves into positions uh, whether hired, paid, or, or uh, volunteer to provide information about these things so that, that libraries get the information. Because otherwise, right now, it's catch, or catch, catch as catch can. Yep. Yes, Bill, thanks for that. Uh, Stephen, please. Thanks. Uh, first of all, sorry for jumping in late. So my first question may, probably was already answered, but uh, this is an incredible resource. Um, 
I would be th thrilled to be able to swim in it myself. Is there any way I can get access to the content of it? Um, and the second question is, um, I noticed in the, um, in the division of uh, time periods that it looked like there was almost twice as much material between 1980 and 2000 as there was no. between 2000 and 2020. Mm -hmm. Is there a selection bias there? Is it less stuff has been produced? Um, well, no, that? so that, that yes, yeah, so you probably weren't present, but that that's an yeah. artifact of uh, some migrations, uh, failed yeah. migrations from mm -hmm. Mendeley. At one point, that was a possible collaboration platform. It didn't really work out. And so in bringing them back into EndNote, what's happened is we've got a number of duplicates, particularly in that zone. So um, not the whole lot. But yeah, there's a few thousand duplicates in there. So it's not, rep this doesn't mean, oh, we were really active in that period and we're not so right. active. It doesn't imply okay. that at all. I think it's probably somewhere in between these two numbers. Yeah. The okay. real the real size of it. Yeah, so it's, it's just an artifact of, oh, you can see straight away here, there's duplicates here. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that needs to be cleaned up. So yeah, that doesn't, it's not significant. There's been gradual growth but not, nothing really significant. I mean, it's a fairly steady, steady as she goes. I think I mentioned earlier that um, a lot of publications that would have come out as little booklets or notes or pamphlets or, you know, something under 50 pages, you know, welcome to the Baha'i faith or here's an introduction on the 19 day feast, all that sort of simple deepening and teaching materials kind of gone by the wayside it's all digital now it's all websites it's all blogs it's all youtube videos probably as much as anything so that introductory material is much less common in print form and so the, the types of material has shifted into um, a lot more shorter form so a lot more articles are being published um, and books are tending in the scholarly direction um, and obviously their audiences um, are fewer in that particular case as well. But yeah, it'd be nice to do some analysis sometime, you know, look at the trends of um, thesis production. Mm. Again, it's fairly steady year on year. Like I haven't seen any really, it's not climbing, uh, which is kind of a little bit disappointing because that really does drive um, innovation and new knowledge and people who are interrogating manuscript collections. But I just think it's the reality the, of the size of the Baha'i community. It's been relatively um, static for the last, mm. I don't know, 30, 40 years, I guess, would be, mm. would be my guess. So the book production reflects it. Um, yep. But for as we think, I think we punch well above our weight <laughs> based on the, the volume of material. So we are literally people of the book. So mm. we take it quite seriously. And the first question on ac accessing this? Yeah, so I mean, uh, you, you can either be, um, become an EndNote um, owner and um, we, I can share this library with you mm -hmm. um, and you can connect to it and essentially download this into your local desktop. Mm -hmm. um, there's no problem doing that or it can be exported into some intermediate format um, and you could, you, you could import it into another product or into um, an online service like Zotero. I don't know, I mentioned Zotero. I don't know if there's any Zotero users here, but you can easily export that as in whatever format. But yeah, I'm not precious about it. The difficulty is um, the, the actual documents. So I've got a mixture of open source and open access documents and some documents that I've acquired by miscellaneous means from friends from uh, you know, people publish it in academia.edu, they, they just leave them lying around websites or on their personal pages or on their curriculum vitae on university personnel sites that they're found everywhere. So I don't, you know, there's the, 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 the copyright legalities of making that available to the public. Um, I don't have any real difficulty um, with colleagues who are using it for their private research. So I would, would have to give you that cache of documents separately um or bundle up the whole endnote set of directories you could also do it that way so there are multiple ways Stephen. i'm happy to collaborate just flick me a note and we can do whatever okay thanks um we're probably down to the last two questions uh, from masood and elsa 
Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Steve. Um, I was wondering among um, various bibliographic sources that you refer to or subscribe to, have you come across with academia? Because that has a lot of interesting journal and full book materials that you can download in PDF format. Yep, no, absolutely. I'm a, I'm a fan of academia.edu. So I, I pay the subscription and you get additional benefits from there, like lots of annoying emails from, from the academia staff. But yeah, it's a good source. So I, I, give, you, I give you an example of that if I can go back to my um, Google search somewhere. Um, this book book review, for example, um, it's about a college level textbook. I think I have the book in the library somewhere. Um, it's a book review, so I, I can't get the book review uh, from my normal sources. But lo and behold, um, Jennifer Kaplan's got it on academia.edu. So if I want the actual, if I want this book review, I mean, it's kind of interesting because there's not that many. Um, introductory books that treat the Baha'i faith on exactly the same par as other um, monotheisms or other Abrahamic religions. So this kind of stands out. But yeah, the book review, yeah, you can definitely find it on academia.edu. Academia.edu has material that's not found anywhere else. So especially manuscripts or work in progress or conference papers that are not yet published or whatever. So yeah, it's one of many, many sources. I mean, I could, yeah, I. It's, I take it serious enough. Um, scribed is another one you will find material on there that you won't find anywhere else. So but then it just becomes a limit of you know how many subscriptions do you hold. But um, yeah, I, I store, I have broad Catholic taste in a lot of different areas. So that's I, what I didn't cover, <laughs> um, electronic books. So, you know, there are other managers like Calibre that can manage electronic books um, much more effectively than EndNote. So because they can interrogate um, other databases to update the catalog. So, and the another area that's really growing is, um, I mentioned that book at the start, um, uh, Nash's new book, um, Edinburgh University Press. Uh, a lot of these publishers now are producing quite a lot of open access material. So Brill, for example, um, has got hundreds of titles and some of them are significant major pieces of scholarship um, that are published as open access so um, the print books are hideously expensive but you can get a digital copy of the book and so the researchers and authors are building these costs into their research proposals and publishing in open access and so Edinburgh University Press does the same that particular title is not um, but there's quite a lot of um, these publishers now doing this. So that's another thing, another to do on my list um, is to more systematically go through that. Not so much for Baha'i material, but just because my other reading interests and tastes, um, uh, open access books. So these are, these are found everywhere now. So yeah, you could just spend your whole life um, reading a lot of open access books, because some of them are very interesting. For example, I think I saw something, uh, this is just some examples. These are all available for download. So there's all sorts in here. This is very um, topical. Uh, you can see that. But there's, there's, there's a whole range of stuff. Now, a lot of publishers are doing this. Um, everywhere all the time so that's you could just keeping up with that as as a full-time job yeah so but yeah but in academia.edu definitely a key a key source but it's only a fraction of the material a lot of material doesn't go there um but there are some unique materials for sure uh thanks steve and thanks master for that question final question for today elsa uh yeah there's two things i'm kind of mulling over um the first is the notion of a significant reference. I was quite intrigued by thinking about that and um, sort of thinking about it in terms of what goes into like a general bibliography as opposed to what uh, 
distinguishing like what a library actually acquires. Just we had something come to us recently that had like a one or two line reference to pioneers in Central African Republic amongst a book that was basically somebody's travel log of going exploring Africa. So, you know, how much effort do you put into that? And, and is there a difference between what goes into a bibliographer bibliography versus what a library requires? So that's kind of one thing I'm just kind of thinking about. And but the second is this may be a little more substantial. Um, is thinking about, uh, you had mentioned, I think, um, that there's a capacity to, uh, or maybe maybe not, maybe you just mentioned something about um, manuscripts, archival material, and that I'm looking, as I'm looking at some of the things that have been put up there, I, I'm just curious as to how, how that, how, how workable that is. And I, just because you know in the realm of finding aids there's lots of different kinds of finding aids and archival materials by their nature are, are quite different beasts and um i uh, i recently developed a bit of a kind of a guidelines just kind of a helpful sort of thing for some researchers that um i kind of observed some people had difficulty knowing how to cite their sources <laughs> and things that they published just generally and that they really didn't know what to do with archival materials and that um so i developed a bit of a guideline based on a few sources that i i, I found um and that it really depends on the material as to what you actually put in a bibliography so then i was thinking well that's really for their individual bibliography say in a book that they would publish or for their footnotes and that maybe this is a different kind of a thing as well but um so next week when um, I, I'll be speaking a bit about archival information networks, um, which is maybe more along the lines of the kind of bibliography that you have. Anyway, I'm sorry, that's not a, like a terribly coherent thing. It's just, you've really got me thinking about these things and uh, yeah, I don't know if there's anything. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think this, this kind of, there, the lines are blurred, right? So for example, um, the Baha'i world has become an online publication. And so there's some quite well written articles there now. Um, and it's, it's, it's episodic, it's not really a serial, it's kind of an online, it's almost like a, it's probably written in a blogging tool from, from memory. And there's no, there's no issues as such, they just, it's just accumulating material. And um, they're not even numbered. So it's like, how do you deal with that? Um, is it a thing? Is it a website? Is it a document? Um, you can, in some cases, um, download a PDF. In other cases, you can't. You literally just have to scrape the screen into a document as best you can. So, yeah, does that fall into the print? Is it a print publication? Is it grey literature? Is it really, do you archive the whole site and treat it as an archival resource? I just don't know. I think the lines are very, are very blurred all the time. Um, you know, there's, there's masses of digitized material um, that have been developed by the um, National Library of France, and um, it's, a, it's a giant archive of material, essentially. And, but you can find all kinds of interesting Baha'i materials in there in French uh, newspapers and magazines and, and intellectual journals in the time that Abdu'l-Baha was in Europe or um, in the period that the, the Baha'i faiths uh, flourished in kind of early Paris or whatever. So that's archival material, I guess, but um, it's also bibliographic material at the same time. You know, like I have in these early, like I'm very interested in what was published prior to um, the declaration of Baha'u'llah. So there is a little bit of material through the 1850s um, in some serials and newspapers. So you're dealing with newspaper archives at this early phase. Um, yeah, and most of this material is probably in archives somewhere. Not all, even all of it's digitized, but in some cases we've been able to find it on public archive sites. So it's massive territory. No one person can incorporate it at all. It, 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 you're at that point where you need multiple collaborators. You need multiple people focusing on thematic areas. Um, geographical areas, um, time periods, or even formats. It's, we just can't move forward unless we rescale up now. It's just one human's effort is just falls short now.
Uh, Elsa, thanks for that question because I, I fully understand uh, the uh, complexities there of using manuscripts in, in Baha'i uh, archives. And I'm going to come back to you on that uh, even after your session next week because I think there's a lot that can be done to help coordinate the referencing of Baha'i manuscript materials. Yep. Uh, Steve, I want to thank you um, for this uh, session today. It's uh, been most illuminating for everybody. Uh, did you have any last uh, uh, well, messages I, for us today? Only to say that um, you know this th this was my handbook when I was editing the Baha'i Studies Review, Butcher's copy editing, and this is this is what all the Cambridge editors use, right? Um, but that's only a tiny fraction, but it has. It has those sort of rules and laws of editing and um, formatting, including archival references, uh, how to do it properly, so to speak. And that's it's a massive tome. It's 500 page tome, just how to do it the Cambridge way. And a librarian. Friend that's of very mine, encouraging. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, we have to sorry. do it. Master a 500 page book. That's... <laughs> it's only if you're publishing with Cambridge journals. There's a whole other one for Oxford, probably. Yes, yes. But you know what I'm saying? This is it's a big, it's a complex game. Another librarian pointed me to this, um, Philip Gaskell, a new introduction to bibliography. And this reminds you that this is this game, if you like, has been going on for hundreds of years. You know, people who are really specialized in this are looking at the type of binding and all kinds of materials, how the how the pages were cut, the, the way the sheets were arranged. There's no end to the um, kind of detail that you can fall into. Um, but what I'm focused on is enriching. Um, I think I mentioned this in my first session that I really want to get to the point where we're in creating and inventing new knowledge at a higher rate, at a higher pace. And we do that by learning from what we've already done. And we've done a lot, but we can get we can move forward faster if we have systems and tools and resources at our disposal. Oh, that's a great statement to make to conclude your session, uh, forward looking and uh, really in a nutshell, bringing together what the essence of this uh, project is. So uh, Steve, thanks for your session today. Thanks to, uh, to everybody who took part and we'll bring it to a close now. So until next time, thank you all. Bye-bye.